Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a CastBox original produced in partnership with our friends at Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and all of your favorite podcasts are there, ripe for the downloading. Sacred Symbols is available wherever you get your podcasts, of course, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot. We think it's pretty rad. To get each episode of Sacred Symbols three days before the public, completely ad-free, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Perks for support include not only getting the show early and ad-free, but you can also gain access to monthly exclusive podcasts, and supporting on Patreon is the only way to get your listener mail read on the air, and much more. Plus, supporting Sacred Symbols on Patreon also nets you perks for other Collins Last Stand shows automatically, including the Nostalgia and Retro Podcast Knockback, the YouTube series dedicated to gaming called SideQuest, and the eclectic interview podcast Fireside Chats. Thank you for your generosity, kindness, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and all things Collins Last Stand would not exist. But enough of that. On to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 26. My name is Kyle Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my lovely co-host, Chris Raygun. Hey, hey, hey. How are you? I'm well. I'm flying. You I'm are flying, flying very soon. Very, very soon. Not soon enough, really. Your flight is at an awkward time. It's at yeah. four in the morning, you were telling me. Yeah, I always take really late flights because it's really hard for me to get to sleep usually. So I figure, oh, by 4 a.m. after all that travel, I'm going to be knocked out on the plane. I'm going to be done. For sure. And it usually works out, so hopefully it works consistently this time. Well, I, w- I will wish you the best. I take red eyes pretty often back and forth when or when I go home, I do. It's just cheaper that way. It's a little bit inconvenient. It's a lot inconvenient, actually. But we're recording this on a Friday. This will post actually on Christmas. It will post on Christmas for patrons or for patrons on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. So Merry Christmas if you're yeah. listening to this. And obviously, for most of you that are listening to this in the free feeds, Merry post Christmas. Hope you enjoyed your holiday. We appreciate you. This episode today, Chris, is a little bit of a hybrid. It's a little bit of a weird episode. We're going to do a little bit of news, talk about what we've been playing a little bit. No drops, so no new games, and no questions from the audience about the news. Instead, what I did was I solicited questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience about their favorite or least favorite memories of 2018, their moments of 2018 pertaining to PlayStation and games that can be playable on PlayStation. We've also compiled three of our own to talk about. So this will be a little bit of a hybrid Try to give a little bit of a remembrance to the year past before we move on to 2019. The next episode after this will just be me solo. It'll be a fireside chat style sacred symbols. I'm going to solicit a bunch of questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas on Patreon. We'll talk for a while. It'll be fun. And then Chris will be back in early January and we're going to do our game of the year and game of the year awards episode. And we're going to do unique episodes or I'm sorry, unique awards for that episode, which will be fun. Yeah. So we'll pick our favorite game, which will be good. But we're also going to see like, you know, we're just going to make awards up. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fun. I think it'll be an interesting way to, to do it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too. So thank you, Chris, for coming over right before your travels. We were going to record this, as you guys might have recalled, right after episode 25. But I was dying. I probably sound I sound congested. I, I can't hear myself. You, uh, you, you do sound a little congested. But it, I hope I sound better. I don't seem or feel as sniffly. We'll see how it goes. We'll see. As we go along. But giving us that extra few days allowed us to rework this episode and incorporate some news because some things have happened yeah, that some, we should talk about. Uh, some cool stuff. I also have to make a correction. This is a correction that I wanted to make that was so significant that I almost recorded a pickup and put it in the last episode, which I never done before, to tell people that this is wrong because I knew people were going to feel like they needed to tell us over and over and over again mm-hmm. that it was wrong. And, and well, they had. We were talking about Obsidian and the Outer Worlds, the game that we're really excited about that was announced at the Game Awards. And we were talking about, well, Microsoft just bought Obsidian. And how is this going to work? Because they obviously just bought the team that made We Happy Few, but We Happy Few was published by someone else or whatever. And I assume that Microsoft might be allowing them to put their game on other platforms. But I guess this deal that Microsoft bought, you know, buying Obsidian This game was already in the works with Private Division. So Microsoft owns the studio. This team is working on this game for someone else contractually. And Microsoft, I guess, has Obsidian working on something else. And this was announced in the days after the announcement of the game. I missed the story. I was with my family. My fault. So that's even more interesting, honestly. Yeah, it's strange because now they have this like weird. Do they have to have like this weird? What is that term? Chinese wall, I think it is when you're at a company and you have to keep parts of the company separated from each other. Yeah, I think that's the term. Like media companies, you keep the sales team behind a Chinese wall from the rest of the company. I think that's the right terminology. So I wonder if they have to do something like that. I wonder if it matters. I wonder 
if this was the game that sold Microsoft on Obsidian, but they just can't have it. Can they have the sequels? It'll be weird. I'm looking forward to the game regardless. And regardless, this will be the last Obsidian game you ever play on a PlayStation platform. So enjoy it. Yeah. Speaking of playing, Chris, are you playing anything interesting that you'd like to talk about before we jump in? I have not had even a remote, a modicum of time to play any. I've been just constantly recording stuff so that I have stuff to edit over the over my trip. But I did uh, pop back into Spider-Man for reasons that we will probably get into. We will. We'll in talk the about the suit in a little while. I'm interested in what you think about this, this whole thing. Yeah. I got to be honest with you, just at the top, if you told me that that suit was the suit he wore in the game, I would have totally believed you. Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I see the picture of the suit. We'll talk about it in a little while. I saw the picture of the suit. I'm like, okay, isn't this what he wore in the game? I don't think it is. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Well, I understand not having time. I haven't had too much time myself. I've been recovering. You know, it's funny, Chris. When I go on travels, I always have this ambition to play more games, specifically on Vita. I have this ambition. I yeah. bring it, I load the Vita up. I'm going I'm to play games. I'm going to lay in bed at night at my mom's and play games. When no one's looking, I'm going to be playing it. I don't play anything when I go home, right? This <laughs> yeah. happens over and over again. Because it's just, like no time. Exactly. So do you go home with this anticipation that you're going to be able to play anything? Not necessarily. You know, you're, you have your Vita now, which is nice. Yeah. But are you going to try to play anything or are you kind of taking a step back for I'm a little gonna while? I'm going to try and play, uh, play through some of my old, uh, the, the PS1 classics I have loaded up on there. I recently got really into Tekken 2 again. I had it installed on the Vita for a while, but I'd, I'd just been like, you know, busy with other stuff. But like, I'm probably going to play a little bit on the plane if I can't fall asleep. Tekken 2 is hard. By the way, I have no idea how I managed to beat that game as a halfling child, but uh, I managed and now I'm uh, struggling. I'm struggling real hard. I insist that we were better at games when we were younger. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm playing. I'm playing Yoshimitsu right now. I, I, I just can't figure it out. The AI just chains together moves in a way that I just I cannot wrap my brain around. So hopefully well, I'm uh, hopefully I'll, I'll manage to beat it over the break. I'm sure you'll manage to beat it over the break now. Oh, that was a sexual innuendo, by the way. It was a sexual joke. Oh, good. I didn't pick up on it at all because I'm that delirious. Yeah. I saw you. You have this like thousand yard stare. I right do. Have, <laughs> I'm very out I've of been, it. I've totally been there. <laughs> so, I'm so out of it right now. But, you know, your Vita use frustrates me a little bit because the PS1 classics are a nice supplement to the content there. But there are games for Vita. That yeah, you can play. yeah, I'm sure. There's nothing on there you want to uh, play. Uh, Uncharted Golden Abyss or Killzone Mercenary. An FPS on a on a on a Vita? It's awesome. Is it? Yeah. Maybe I'll give it it's a, a shot. It's a great game. <laughs> it really I really bought it specifically with the intent of playing PlayStation 1 games on it. I know and that's Because why. for some reason you can't on the PS4. No, it's very annoying. I mean, even the PS1, even the PS1 Classic is like a horrible way to experience it. So, actually what I plan on doing over this break is uh getting my old PlayStation 1, which is uh which has been modded so I can play burnt games on it. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna have a blast. Remember that term, burnt games? Yeah, burnt is that not a CDs. Yeah, I guess it's not a term anymore. Well, because uh, you don't burn games. What was I thinking about the other you just, day? Uh, you just uh, callously steal them from yeah, the internet. No, exactly. <laughs> like I forgot that I think the last two or three laptops I bought don't even have a CD drive on them. Yeah, my laptop and someone doesn't either. Was giving them to me. What the fuck was it? Like I just took something from someone and be like, oh yeah, I'll just put it on my computer. <laughs> and like you know, like and, and then I'm like looking on the side of my laptop and I'm like, oh yeah, there is no. Yeah. CD drive. It's probably been seven years since I've used a CD drive. You got to get that. Uh, what, what is it? That external HD DVD drive that uh, the 360 came with. So oh, I love it. I'll go even more old school. Do you remember the remember zip drives? Do you remember zip disks? Yeah. Oh, I loved those. I had a zip drive in the late 90s on my Sony Vio. For people that don't know, zip drives came with these disks that held 100 megabytes and it was like revolutionary. Oh, nuts. It was revolutionary. It was awesome. And then they had like something even bigger than that. But I don't remember what it was in that same family. I think it was 300 megabytes. Anyway, I don't know how the hell we got down this this uh, road. It, oh, I was expressing disappointment in you. Yeah, right. So that's how we got. That's, that's a typical thing that yeah. I'm used to. Yeah. So, well, we'll get you. At least you have it. We'll start to introduce some things. And one of the games you might be interested in playing on it is a game that I've been playing this past week. The only time I've had, the only thing I've ever had any time for, actually. Oh, Super Life is, of Pixel? Well, uh, well, no, that, but Reverie, this game Reverie that I discussed briefly last week that I had wanted to play but didn't get a chance to play. It's kind of like an old school Zelda game. It's earthbound. It's very bite-sized. I'm not quite done with it yet. It's really good. It's really, really, really fun. Very simple and straightforward and very satisfying. I highly recommend it to people out there. If you're looking for something, go look up videos for it. You know, Reverie is what it's called. It's really a great game, and I'm really enjoying it. Very bite-sized, again, and very uh, manageable if you don't have a lot of time to play. 
And I downloaded, and I don't know if you saw this on Twitter. Well, you did, because you, you recommended that I play Doom. <laughs> I put out a plea late last night. I was bored. I'm looking for a distraction. I don't know what to play. I have all this shit on my cross media bar. I have literally 450 games in my library on PS4. I don't want to play anything. So I was like, what should I play? Give me an action RPG, something statistical, but playable, arcadey. People kept bringing up Nier Automata. Yeah. And, and have you been messing, messing around with it? I downloaded it. That's about as far as I've gotten. It's so funny because yesterday about 3.30 in the morning, I was awake. I was on my PS4 and I stared at it <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the bar for like a minute. And I had a dialogue with myself. And I'm like, I just can't do this right now. So maybe tonight. You'll get into it. I played a little bit of, uh, a little <laughs> bit of it. It's, uh, it's an enjoyable. It's enjoyable. I think you'll like it once you give it a fair shot. I have it's it really in good my 50 library. hours in. What's that saying I, that everybody tells me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Says It'll get, it gets good 50 hours in. <laughs> Just keep on going. It's a Final Fantasy 13 syndrome. Final Fantasy 13 was awful until it was 40 hours in. So thank yeah, God yeah. you spent 40 hours in. By the way, I recommended Doom in jest, but also because you said hack and slash, which could translate to rip and tear. Yeah, well, ooh. Yeah, kind of different terminology, but also similar terminology. I understand that completely. And I forgot, I put a little query out and then i said don't dare recommend me dark souls or bloodborne i'm gonna fucking lose it you know please don't but i forgot to say don't recommend me kingdom hearts ah and oh man maybe you'll like it who knows we're never gonna know That's, i would do, i would do a donald duck impression but i realized recently that i'm incapable of making that horrendous noise i don't even want to try no you no, because you, you look like a dumbass yeah i don't want to <laughs> you look like wanna, a damn fool i don't want to try so yeah, check out Reverie, and then yeah, I'm going to jump into Nier Automata, some other stuff I'm excited to play as we prepare for our random Games of the Year award. I'm going to do a Game of the Year video, too, on SideQuest. That will be a traditional Game of the Year video. I don't want to be our Game of the Year episode to be traditional. Yeah. So we'll give it some time. We'll gestate on it. We'll be back to you Have you played year. Beat Saber at all? No, that's on the list. Oh, Beat well, Saber you're a and dang Super fool, Colin. Beat Saber and Superbot are both, or uh, Super, what, not Superbot, Super, it's the other game on VR that people yeah. have been the platformer astrobot not superbot superbot's the studio that made playstation all-stars battle royale all right should we get into the news yes number one the dreams beta which was first promised for 2016 and then 2017 and then 2018 is finally out and it's coming out in early 2019 better yet some people will gain early access before the calendar year turns in fact some of you are playing it right now the beta will run through january 21st and those who are on media molecules mailing list may have already gotten invites the beta will then go public sometime during the week of January 8th. We'll be very interested to hear how you guys like it, though the beta apparently comes packing an NDA, so we may not hear much after all. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Now, not surprisingly, I guess Sony didn't reach out to us about this, maybe because all I do is talk shit about the <laughs> game. But I, I would think that they'd want us to try it out. I'm Are interested you interested in, in trying it? Yeah, I'm interested in it. I think it'll be, uh, I actually think it looks kind of optimistic. Well, it's supposed to be good. I mean, the write-ups, I think, from E3 were very positive. Yeah. About it. The main weird thing about it is just, like, the market for it. I think as a product, it's going to be really solid. Yeah, who's going to buy it, though? That's the question. I mean, when I saw that Detroit Become Human only sold 2 million copies, I don't know if that's considered... I mean, that's good for Quantic Dream. Is that, like, does that exceed their expectations considering there's like almost 90 million ps4s in the wild now and dreams has been in development for so long and sony owns that studio what is their expectation you yeah know? it's not going to sell millions of copies i just don't believe that prove me wrong how do you market it how do you get people to want to engage and play with it i don't know i'd love to be wrong yeah it's a challenge marketing that game i don't envy the person with that task so anyway dreams beta it is real it is coming it might already be available to you right now go enjoy and earlier than i anticipated presumably if this is the beta run it's probably a late 2019 release. Yeah. And by the way, I didn't put this in the news because this just happened, but I'm kind of up in the air about some release dates now because Neil Druckmann, who, as people probably know, vice president of Naughty Dog and the creative director behind The Last of Us and The Last of Us Part Two, just tweeted out a picture of them still doing mocap for a scene and said, we'll have more for you next year. Hmm. So does that mean it's not coming out next year? Interesting stuff. Hmm. I don't know. I think I would still probably bet, but that is odd. For sure. Yeah, I mean, you have to film pickups and all sorts of stuff late in the game, and mocap makes that kind of stuff a lot easier than having to render it, I guess, by hand. But it is a little interesting. That taken with Death Stranding and some stuff people have been sending me about how they're saying they're getting all the Japanese VO done now and stuff like that, indicating that the script is at least locked down. So lots in the air right now. Just wanted to throw that out there. A little interesting tidbit. Number two, 
The MPD Group, which tracks video game hardware and software sales in the United States, has released sales data for the month of November 2018. The best-selling game for the month across platforms was Red Dead Redemption 2, followed by Call of Duty Black Ops 4, Battlefield 5, and Fallout 76. Other notable games include Spiral Reignited Trilogy at 9, Assassin's Creed Odyssey at 11, Spider-Man at 13, God of War at 16, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 17. On PS4 itself, the best-selling games in America for the month of November were in order. Red Dead Redemption 2, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, Fallout 76, Battlefield 5, NBA 2K19, Spiral Reignited Trilogy, Madden NFL 19, Spider-Man, FIFA 19, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Call of Duty Black Ops 4 is currently the best-selling game of 2019 so far. So I wanted to stop there real quick. That means it's better selling than even Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. With Red Dead Redemption 2 in second place, NBA 2K19 in third, and Far Cry 5 in fourth. Spider-Man and God of War, both PS4 exclusives, are the sixth and seventh best-selling games of the year across digital and retail in the United States. Additionally, MPD revealed that Spider-Man is the fastest selling superhero game in American video game history. That's not surprising at all. Yeah, I was thinking about what could be the competition. The Arkham games, I think, are the only ones that came to mind that would be selling on that level. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And maybe games on PS2 where that is actually kind of impressive considering Arkham. If Arkham is being taken into account, considering Spider-Man is an exclusive. Yeah, that's what makes that it is, so significant, Yeah, I think. And that's what I think makes God of War and Spider-Man sales generally on MPD charting so high as best-selling games across platforms makes it so significant, too. So more power to them. Those exclusives are doing very well. And we'll talk about those exclusives in our memories in a little while. Number three, beloved niche publisher limited run games. Oh, this story makes me so mad, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> is having a difficult time fulfilling its orders for physical Vita games. So much difficulty, in fact, that it's putting 10 Vita releases on hold while it figures out how to proceed. The issue, according to Josh Fairhurst, the owner of Limited Run Games, is that Vita cartridge allotments from Sony are far lower than expected. As you may recall, physical Vita releases won't happen past 2019, and publishers have to get their orders in near the end of the first quarter of the year. Fairhurst tweeted that because the allotment is lower than expected, quote, we are being forced to put a pretty large swath of releases, over 10 on hold, unless another publisher gives us some of their allotment, end quote. He clarified in follow-up tweets that he isn't angry at Sony for it, and that it's a, quote, a tricky situation. But frankly, it sounds like ineptitude, and this is me talking, on Sony's part. Why wouldn't they merely manufacture enough Vita carts to fulfill demand? This is really weird to me the way that Sony insists on treating Vita. I've been watching them try to strangle it to death for six years against <laughs> everyone's wishes that actually plays it. Now, I'm not asking for them to manufacture it or take a loss or anything like that, but this is weird. There's no possible explanation why they can't just fulfill the orders one last time as ordered. Yeah, especially if it's just one last time. Yeah, they, they s- definitely have that capital to do that. Yeah, they definitely have the means. It's just weird to me. Like, what is the excuse for this? Like there's people that are interested in buying these games. You gave them a date and they submitted orders and now they have to have like a carbon tax swap basically with each other for Vita cartridges. So now limited run games has to go out there and hope that someone else gives up their cartridges. They don't need them. It's very strange. And this has killed the business of it seems like maybe a dozen or more Vita games and that money going into independent developers pockets and limited run games pockets. Very weird stuff and very frustrating. It's such nonsense, such Sony style nonsense. If you want to kill the Vita finally and say this is the last time where you're going to submit your orders, fine. But why can't you fulfill the orders that are being made? Yeah, don't promise that you, you, you're going to be able to fulfill demand up until a certain point as long as you let us know if you're not going to be able to do that. Right, exactly. Yeah, kill it if no one's buying the games anymore. But this is so disappointing because this is like anticlimactic, just the way it should be for Vita. You know, like everyone's like, all right, one last run of all the games we want. And they're like, no. Nah. Sorry. <laughs> it's so sad. Yeah, you know, it's very sad. The Viking funeral is going to happen sooner than we all might think. Yeah. And that's very sad for me. We got to get that all sorted. For people that don't know, I've, I'm going to hire Chris to make it for me. Do a beautiful Viking, you know, Vita funeral just the way that it needs to be done. Yeah. The vision of Chris Raygun. And I'm sure it's going to be awesome and disturbing <laughs> all at the same time. Number four, if you're still playing Minecraft on PlayStation 3 or Vita, don't expect any new updates. Word comes by way of 4J Studios, the team responsible for taking care of legacy ports of Minecraft, as relayed by Eurogamer. The team tweeted a picture of their packed up dev kits for old hardware, including PS3 and Vita, following through on a promise Microsoft made earlier in 2018 when it said older machines make up less than 5% of Minecraft's user base, and that it was time to sunset legacy additions. So again, PS3 and Vita's last updates have come for Minecraft. So everything is dying Yeah, as things happen to die in the winter. Yeah, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, everything's dead. I know, it's awful. <laughs> It's a bloodletting. Good Lord. 
Number five, Housemark, the team behind classic PlayStation arcade exclusives ranging from Super Stardust and Dead Nation to Resogun and Alien Nation, is working on a battle royale game called Storm Divers that you already know. What you may not know is that they're also gearing up on an unannounced AAA game. Word comes by way of a Medium post that Housemark threw up just yesterday at the time of recording this, which stated that the team, which was once fewer than two dozen, has scaled up to 70, and that the team simply had to adapt or die, which is why they are abandoning their arcade roots. It's an interesting read, one worth checking out, but I'm skeptical. It's going to work out for them. I hope it does. I love those guys. I know them personally. Very nice guys. But them turning their backs on their arcade legacy really rubs me the wrong way. It just it just does. It just rubs me the wrong way. I don't yeah. understand. I understand the adapt or die mentality, but I also understand that I don't think they've been releasing their best games that show that. Resogun was amazing. If they kept making games that, of that caliber, I don't think that they'd have sales problems. Yeah, yeah. no, that's really sad. This is, a, this is a bit of a downer week. I know. Yeah, happy holidays. <laughs> to everyone from Sacred Merry Symbols. Christmas. Everything's sad. And finally, just one other piece of news to get out of the way before we get into our memories, which is what this episode is really all about. Spider-Man on PS4 finally has the much-requested so-called Raimi suit, and you can download that for free so long as you own the game. I'm really happy about that. Yeah, so talk to me a little bit about this. So this was a big... So Raimi is the guy who made the... 2002 Spider-Man game or movies, right? The ones Sam like- Raimi was the person who he directed uh, Spider-Man one, two, and three, and uh, you know that's a that's a suit that I really really like because it's 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 very nostalgic for me. It was like the first time that I'd seen, or I think anybody had seen like a superhero movie in theaters that was actually not horrendous, or at least like for a while, like since like maybe Batman. It'd been a while since uh, we had a good superhero movie, and that suit's just got a, a unique look to it. It's got very weird, angular eyes. The webbing is, like, extruded, and it's... it's. I always uh, I always had a fondness for that suit, so it's nice to see it back. The still that they released of the in-game asset for it, I thought was just a shot from the movie. It's, ins- it's insane how beautiful that game is. Like, I forget sometimes. It just looks the same to me. I didn't look at like the difference between them, but I'm just like, if you put it that screenshot for me, I was like, this is what Spider-Man was in the game to begin with. Like, I believe you. Nah, dude. It's so distinct to me. I guess it is, unless you're really paying attention to it, you might just be like, oh, isn't that the suit he was always wearing? That was kind of my issue with a lot of the DLC suits. They were just like, oh, this just looks like more it's just the Spider-Man suit. But this is like, oh, that's that's the one he wore. That's in that movie where he does the dance. <laughs> I liked those movies, And when he way. freeze frames at the, at the end of, uh, what's that? song raindrops keep falling on my head i love those movies i actually remember going to see the first one when i was a senior in high school and, and really enjoying it not having any connection at all yeah you know i was very fond of course of the bone saw scene the bone saw is ready scene but apart from that i thought it was fine you know yeah. i thought it was fine and i guess it set up some sort of precedent for good superhero movies that marvel yeah. still has today oh absolutely i think it's probably the first one that that worked i think well i'm happy everyone's happy this was a big to do by the way and you know I was going to write up this thing and post online, but I decided not to. It really does show, and I don't mean this is like an insult to anyone at all, but there's just this toxicity in the game sphere. That, oh, that, that like people were like bullying Insomniac for not putting the suit in? Yeah, but it annoys me because you have to be insane to think that they didn't know that you wanted it and yeah. that it wasn't in motion. And it really showed me... I think most gamers, especially people that listen to this show and these kinds of shows, are very knowledgeable about games and how they're made and how they're marketed and all that kind of stuff. But it really did show a certain ignorance amongst a certain fraction of very loud people that do not understand how video games are made. Don't don't understand that you can't just put something in a game, that it needs to be prepared, that Marvel is notoriously difficult to work with, that they have to get everything just so. It's just very silly the way people treat each other online about video games and especially betraying kind of an ignorance about how the whole about how the sausage is made. Yeah, and, it, I think it's ridiculous that people were harassing them about it. And it's also ridiculous that people think that they just threw this in there as a result of it. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. That's insane to be like this was in the works for quite a while. I'm happy and I'm happy that it was and they deserve all the credit for it. But I guess to play devil's advocate and I don't defend the people who are harassing Insomniac. I do think a lot of people are just being used to nickel and dimed for everything that they're worth. And it's been a while since I can recall that there's been a freebie like this. Like I can't recall the last free thing that I've seen in a video game, like especially something as significant and like beloved as the classic Raimi suit in a Spider-Man game like it's a very nice gesture from Insomniac that I feel like we're not used to seeing 
And I think that that's kind of given rise to a lot of cynicism and just toxicity in general. Yeah, I think pe- I, you're absolutely right. And I think people need to just reel it in a little bit. But you also need to stop harassing developers. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, I don't think it's the people that really listen to this podcast. I think the people that listen to this podcast are pretty sophisticated. And, uh, yeah. you know, and I'm not trying to just blow smoke up your guys asses. I, I have conversations with you all the time. You are a sophisticated audience. You understand a little bit more than the average bear about how games are made. But reading these this shit on Twitter and on social media about how easy it is. And it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And this is causing so much annoyance for a studio that delivered one of the great games of the year to you and has done so very fairly, very judiciously. And and I think at a great value. So yeah, congratulations to all of you for finally getting what you want. All right. Props to Insomniac for just the generosity of this. For sure. Also, East 9, Monstrum Knox, the newest action RPG in the long-running East franchise, which I love, has been announced that will launch on Japanese PS4s in 2019. There's no reason to believe it won't come westward at some point. And the Australian Games Rating Board, and this is an interesting one, posted a new rating for something called Catherine Classic, which seems to point to an Atlas, the Atlas game from 2011. As you know, a reworked version of Catherine is coming to PS4 and Vita next year, so this may be the original port for other platforms. It may have nothing to do with the PlayStation hardware. We shall see. On their classifications, they don't put actual platforms. They, it just says multi-platform. So my assumption is that Xbox One is probably getting this version and PS4 will get the better version. But all right, Chris, that's all the news. I just wanted to collect all of that, get that all out there in ether since we're not going to be talking to you guys for a little while. Again, episodes will go out as usual, but we're going to do a Q&A style kind of thing next week. So uh, presumably nothing important will happen until we, we meet again. I'm sure. Yeah. Now, Chris, I want you to kick off. I asked you to make three memories Three kind of remembrances of this year. I also made three. We have a bunch from the audience. We're going to read through those, but we'll go back and forth first. So talk to me about what one of your favorite memories of 2018 was. Oh, this may shock a lot of people, Colin. I don't know if people are expecting me to talk about the fact that Crash Team Racing is finally happening and that that made the top list for me. I don't know. I don't know what to say about this, except I'm over the moon about it. I'm still kind of worried that they might mess it up. It filled me with much, much joy in ways that Probably nothing else did this year. I'd like to think that when you say nothing else, like nothing else. Actually, it, it, straight up. Nothing. Yeah. OK, OK, good. I want the depressing nature of this podcast <laughs> to continue unabated <laughs> as much as possible. No, you know what? It's funny, man, because ever since the original Crash trilogy was kind of revealed as coming to PS4 and we didn't really know anything about it and we didn't know it was actually a remake. We thought it was like some sort of upscale or whatever. I just kind of kept doubting it. I was like, no one gives a shit about this. Crash Bandicoot's dead. They're not going to do it. And then when they announced it, I'm like, all right, so they're just f- finally porting everything. They all doubted. Then- they all uh, doubted me, Colin. I was they wrong. All, every- they all doubted. And yet here I am standing victoriously on the mountaintop. I know you are. I mean, I can't deny it. I've been totally wrong about this entire trajectory. I mean, even the sales figures for Crash Twin, what, not, not Twin Sanity. Oh, my God. Jesus. Crash, Crash Insane Trilogy yeah. have been very strong. And the sales for its kind of cousin Spyro Trilogy have been really strong, too. So I've been wrong all the way. So I don't know why I ever doubted that they were going to do this game because even so remove all of the stuff I was wrong about with the original Crash Trilogy. Now this kind of rumor mill started. I'm like, there's no way that they're going to do Crash Team Racing. You know, <laughs> why would they ever do that? Because Who it's the best shit? kart racer in the and world, then here Colin. We are, and then here we are again. And people still love it to this day. Clearly. I remember I saw this art, uh, this IGN article recently that it was like, opinion, Crash Team Racing is better than Mario Kart. And I'm like, oh, suddenly, suddenly everybody's on the bus with me. How nice. That's going to be a little bit annoying for you to experience because that's exactly how I feel. I feel like a hipster. Yeah, no, exactly. This is exactly how I felt about Majora's Mask and Wind Waker. Two (laughs) games everyone hated when they came out. Everyone hated Wind Waker. (laughs) I remember I was on those Game Facts message boards, friends. I remember what you were saying about the game. It It always happens. It's insane. Now everyone loves Wind Waker. Now it's a it's a fucking classic, even though everyone hated it. Yeah, now Crash Team Racing is all of a sudden better than Mario Kart. No, that's, well, that's a that's a reasonable. That's just, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not salty about it. It's a reasonable and exuberant choice. All right, Chris, mine, my first one, I should say, is how excited I was and how unusual I thought the announcement was that Sony will not be at E3 next year. This is something that happened just more recently in the gaming industry, and I'm thrilled that Sony's making this move. I think it's fucking awesome. I yeah. think it's finally helping put to bed maybe the importance of this one day. I know people get excited about it, but I think it's so nerve wracking for publishers and developers to have to deliver to this one day every year, year in and year out in this escalation, this arms race. And Sony's finally like, you know, we have nothing. We have nothing. We didn't even <laughs> have anything at last time. Yeah. And they did it anyway. And they did this weird art show. <laughs> 
Exactly. Basically, this weird modern art performance. So I love that they were like, you know what? We don't need to be there. It shows confidence in their brand and in their product to say like, we're maybe above this. We don't need to be here, you know? And I'm sure maybe they'll be back in the future, but they're not going to be on the show floor. They're not doing a press conference. I know that they're about to go silent, but it raises great intrigue for me as a PlayStation fan. I want to know what's going on and what they're going to show and how they're going to roll things out. It creates a lot of speculation and speculative kind of energy, which I get excited about. So that's definitely one of the great moments and reveals for me of the entire year. And I know that it frustrates and disappoints some other people, but E3 really, you know, my first E3 was 2004. Mm -hmm. That E3 was a lot different than my last E3, which was last year. Right. right. Like they're totally different shows. They're not as big. More people go because they let the public in and more people are in the industry that write and cover games now. So it's easier to get a badge. But the spread of games, the importance of what was coming out of there, all of that has kind of waned, I think, significantly. And I think it's smart for some of these companies to get out of there and start putting the spotlight on them as individual brands. You know, I think you're probably right. I still kind of lament it. It's like my Super Bowl kind of it's just an excuse to gather a bunch of my friends around who just happen to be interested in video games and just be like, hey, look at that. Kingdom Hearts had another horrendous trailer. Uh, well, What's we the- won't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. That's another thing. No more Kingdom Hearts trailers. Yeah. God which, bless. Which will be one of my favorite moments next year. Yeah. Or maybe we'll actually get a few launch trailers. So I'll have to. In 2020, that will be one of my favorite moments on that Sacred Symbols episode. When we do our favorite moments of 2020, we'll do no Kingdom Hearts trailers. That will <laughs> definitely be one of them. Yeah. So I, I, I'm excited about this. I, I'm looking forward to this. I think this creates incredible intrigue. It, it breaks them out of the cycle. It also puts a lot of pressure on Microsoft. So Microsoft could really seize the day. This is a carpe diem moment for that brand, too. The spotlight will be on them, and they're either going to deliver or they're not. And I actually think that we might even see their next console, because I think they're going to go first. So lots of excitement. We don't get many moments like this. Years like 20, you know, 2012 and 2013, years like 2006, 2007, you know, years like 99, 2000, 2001, those years don't come very often. What I mean by that is when all this new stuff is gestating and there's excitement and we don't know what it is. We've the first time I remember the first time I, I played a PlayStation 4. I remember the first time I held a controller. I saw the cross media bar. I remember seeing a trophy pop for the first time. Like, it's fun. Yeah, it's no, exciting. It's new, and it's new and exciting. and It's yeah. mysterious. I was in a conference room in Japan when they were playing Knack, showing something about the PS4 in the summer of 2013 and a trophy popped. No one had seen it before. This was like the first time we had ever seen how a trophy popped on the console. And I just tweeted it out and it got like great interest. Like it's every little thing, you yeah. know, about the console. So I can't wait to see PS5. I think it's exciting. And I think that you them know. not being at E3 signals the beginning of the shift to the new console. Yeah. Very exciting. Stuff. Oh, definitely. Chris, what's next on your list? Next is uh, <laughs> Fallout 76's launch and how how much of a domino effect train wreck it was. Like, it just consistently got worse, and it was just fascinating to look at as an onlooker. Just the way everything collided and just tumbled down a mountain in complete harmony. It was amazing how bad it all was, yet amazing how well the game has sold. Yeah, apparently it's selling super well. Now, assisted and aided, as we've discussed by, I think, lower prices almost out of the gate. But yeah. we're talking about millions of copies of this game sold. And that's pretty remarkable stuff, considering how much everyone seems to hate it. So, again, it shows you how our little sphere and how the very engaged gamer does not speak for the larger consumer. Just like Farming Simulator 19 sold a million copies, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. The majority of people don't follow this stuff. The majority of people just look, oh, it's a Fallout game. I guess I'll buy it. And they play it and then they probably regret it. But I mean, they they, they did buy it and they did play it. They did buy it. I'd be interested to see the engagement numbers on that game. If people are sticking around, like selling games is great, but how many people are actually playing it? I think those numbers are are considerably less uh, <laughs> less brag worthy. I think a lot of people have jumped ship from that game already. I was pretty light on it. I was pretty like optimistic about it and even uh, not particularly harsh about it. But even I was just like, I'm, oh, that's off my console already. Yeah, you just deleted it. Yeah, it's gone. I, I looked at it for a little bit and I'm like, ah, I've seen the 76 there looks kind of nice on the media bar. But that was really it. And I immediately was just like, I'm done with this. Yeah, I did. I, retrieved the code because we got codes from our friends at Bethesda, which we appreciate. But so I retrieved it, but I never even downloaded it. I'm just like, you know what? I'm not even going to actually take the next step. I'm yeah. just going to put it in my library. Maybe one day, very unlikely, but maybe one day I will actually go and play this. But I really doubt it. It's more likely that I'll probably play Kingdom Hearts 3, which is to say <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking so much shit about Kingdom Hearts. I don't mean to rile you out, rile you guys up out there. I know it riles you. <laughs> We're up. just being assholes. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
my next announcement is well, this is a weird one this moment when bloodstained curse of the moon was the surprise announcement and then it was kind of available not immediately but, but pretty soon I like this idea of complementing games with other games and any creates is a team that does this and has done this in the past with you know Azure Striker Gunvolt and kind of the accompanying game that came with it that was a you know it's kind of an 8-bit more simplistic game and Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is actually, you know, Dollars to Donuts, one of the great games of the year, straight the fuck up. Even if it is a 2D, 8-bit looking Castlevania 3 ripoff, that game is really, really awesome. And I love how they just, you know, we've been getting impatient with Bloodstained. It keeps getting delayed. They canceled the Vita version. All sorts of stuff's happening with it. And then suddenly they're like, but but we've been parallel developing this other game as an ode to one of the great Castlevania games of Castlevania 3. And so... I needed to acknowledge that moment because I feel like it came and went and it came and went pretty quick. And the people that were excited about it were excited about it. The people that weren't, you know, never even knew it existed. But Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is awesome and really runs the danger, if you want to look at it this way, of being better than Ritual of the Night, which is interesting to me. It, it runs the, the danger of being better than the actual game when it comes out. Mm. And a lot of people are saying that it is pound for pound a rebuilt version of Castlevania 3. It's awesome. It's just so good. So good. So I wanted to give a shout out to them, not only to Ega for having the kind of foresight to complement its game and kind of create an environment and a universe for Bloodstained. It's not just going to be this one off Castlevania thing. It looks like they're going to make something out of this. And I'm excited about it. So I wanted to give them a shout out. There. That was the happiest I've ever seen you. Like he, he was glowing just now. I thought it was daytime. It's the only time I played Switch this year because they only had Switch codes initially, like before the game came out. So they gave me it and I you know, played it for a little while and then I just downloaded it when it was available on Vita and just you know, put it in PS4 and put it away. But that's how excited I was to play Curse of the Moon. I played it on something else and I don't do that very often. <laughs> that's how you know. You know, I literally gave my Xbox one to my my sister's boyfriend, as I said, because I just never play it. So I'm, just saying, I'm like, you know, what? you can have this. You'll yeah. get much more use out of it than I will, you know, and then I couldn't play Cuphead. Alas. What is your final moment before we get, you know, to my final moment that we'll get into the audience? Chris? Oh, the uh, Obsidian's, uh, <laughs> the trailer for The Outer Worlds, uh, Obsidian's new game, and how just obviously passive aggressive it was <laughs> towards uh, Bethesda, or at least if they didn't intend it that way, I, I don't even care because it, <laughs> it it definitely read that way and I loved it. It brought such a smile to my face because for those of you who haven't seen the trailer, it starts off every time they say like developed by it's basically said from the from the original creators of Fallout and the people who uh, brought you Fallout New Vegas. And it's just like, <laughs> Jesus, Christ. that's so that's so on the nose. It had that had to be intentional. Oh, I'm sure because everything is just working and gelling together just so this year to really make Bethesda Game Studios not look good. Yeah, and this just, was just this was the icing on the cake. This. This happened after Fallout 76. We didn't need this. Yeah, I, I just I just love the attitude of it because it reminds me of like the 90s almost where like Crash Bandicoot had like a megaphone outside of Nintendo's offices screeching at him like a psychopath. Those are, are iconic commercials. Yeah, but it just it, 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 there's something about it. It was it was more subtle than that, obviously. But uh, I like uh, I like the attitude. Me too. And I like the boldness of them just saying, like, fuck it, we're going to do it ourselves. And obviously they're doing it with a partner. We talked about it at the, at the top because I was mistaken about who that partner was. So in, in case you are jumping around, go back and listen to that if you want more clarification on that front. But yeah, good point and good poll, because I think that that's a game that suddenly everyone's really excited about. And I, I think there's every reason to be excited about it because we're kind of I don't want to say we're starving for open world RPGs. That's not true at all. But in that mold, we're kind of looking for something that is not being fulfilled. It wasn't fulfilled by Fallout 4. It certainly wasn't fulfilled by Fallout 76. And so someone else is just going to fill the vacuum. This is capitalism. It is. My final moment before we get into the audience's thoughts, Chris, I wanted to give a shout out to Quantic Dream. And I wrote here on our list, Quantic Dream Surpassing Expectations. I think a lot of people were down on Detroit Become Human. And I was, too, because Beyond Two Souls, which came out in 2013, kind of in the shadow of PlayStation 4, but it was a PS3 game. It just wasn't very good. I know some people like it, but I think that the general consensus is that Heavy Rain, which came out in 2010, I think, early 2010, was just a superior game. And I certainly think so. I think Heavy Rain's awesome. Really good game. And you can play that on PS4 now as well. But Quantic Dream kind of was on coming off of an off game. People weren't impressed by it. And I don't think Detroit really was getting a lot of the respect that it deserved. It reminded me a lot of Until Dawn where people just didn't pay attention to it until it was out. And then they realized like, oh, this is actually really good. Oh, yeah. And, and I understand people's skepticism about it, but it's nice to see Quantic Dream be able to deliver a triple A quality experience like that 
that doesn't rely on gunplay, that doesn't rely on platforming and killing anything necessarily or anything like that. And I know that people make fun of these kinds of games, but I don't get it. Like, I just straight up don't get why you would make fun of it. There's a place for everything. And yeah. having a thoughtful story driven game where you're basically interacting with it and going through more mundane motions, that's fun in its own right. I was really enamored by Detroit. I don't play games the way I used to play them where I'd tear through them. I beat Detroit in a day and a half and I don't play games like that. And I'm not saying it's a 40 hour game and I beat it. I never slept. But, <laughs> you know, Red Dead, it took me like a month to beat. Now, that's a long game, but I also was like, I'm not playing this for more than a few hours a day at some point. It's like, I'm not doing this. Yeah. And Detroit, I just couldn't stop playing. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And, you know, I'm proud of Quantic Dream for delivering that experience. And I feel like it's a good swan song because I don't think we're going to see them on PlayStation again as an exclusive developer. Oh, you don't think so? I think there's too much drama with that studio in France with the kind of the stuff going on behind the scenes. They've been sued by people. They say the wrong thing sometimes. And as I said last week, I think David Cage, just right or wrong, just gets a lot of shit. Yeah. But I really think Detroit, you know, if it wasn't for Red Dead, I got to really kind of sit down. I really got to sit down and think this out. But I think that Detroit was definitely my game of the year until Red Dead came out, you know, and, and it's still definitely in that conversation. And I feel like it's getting short shrift because it came out in a year for PlayStation, as we'll discuss in our other memories from the audience where Sony really delivered. Yeah. So no, this is a very good year. And it's 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 <laughs> it's kind of sad. Really. Yeah. In a, in a in a weird way. So want to give a shout out to them. One of my favorite moments was being completely shocked that it wasn't bad. And I, I know that that's... No, I was shocked too, honestly, because you know, I, was, I was pretty down on it. Because I even... I didn't play much of Heavy Rain, but I just did not get into it back when it came out. Maybe I just... At that point, I just wasn't looking for that kind of game. And uh, Beyond Two Souls looked just awful from friends' accounts and, and just some of the videos that I'd seen been cir circling around on the internet. I had every reason to think that this game was going to be horrendous, and I actually did enjoy it. I never finished it, sadly, but not for any quality reasons. I just got sucked in by everything else that came out that year. Yeah, it's just one it's of those. It's just such a good year for video games. I recommend if people haven't played it, I think you can get it for a nice discount now. Go play it. it take a, take a few days with it. It's I think it's worth your time. I think it was totally worth sixty dollars. If you can get it for thirty dollars now or forty dollars, I think it's absolutely worth it, that price. And and I, I'll be excited to see what they do next. These are the kinds of games that I think kind of give texture to our ecosystem. It's the same reason why I don't understand why people d disparage walking simulators and adventure games and and story driven games and games where you kind of interact and not play you know, per se, I think those are gameplay experiences. They're, they're immersive experiences. They have a place. There's one side that's very hoity-toity about like, you know, I don't want to kill things and I don't want to interact. I don't want to shoot anything. And then there's this yeah, other what if side. You could talk to the, <laughs> what if you could talk to the demons? Yeah, exactly. And then the other side, there's another side that's like, that just doesn't acknowledge that there's a place and a space for the vanishing of Ethan Carter or for everybody's gone to the rapture or oh, one of my home. favorite one of my favorite games I can't remember what year it came out was uh, the Stanley Parable which is a PC exclusive but apparently it's coming to consoles they, that was announced at the Game Awards yes so I'm pretty excited for that because if you if you're on PS4 and you've only played PS4 that's a game you should absolutely play because it's hilarious and it's a walking simulator you don't kill anything in that and it's, that's the kind exactly the kind of game I'm looking for like I, I'm not looking for that all the time. But we have to think about, I mean, the reality, Chris, is that we have reduced gameplay to killing things most of the time or to like interacting in a destructive way with the environment. And I think that that's fine. Like, I love shooting shit. Oh, yeah, I love too. killing shit in video games. I love destroying things. But it's cool that people are thinking outside of the box and saying like, well, why is this always the default? You know, and yeah. like, why can't we do something else? And I'm like, OK, that's cool. I'm, I'm down with that. Yeah. They can coexist. I think there's a weird like contingency of people who are like, hey, you know, uh, maybe it's not really a majority of people, but the, it's always a like vocal minority who's like, we don't need the killing games anymore. We should have we should have a game where you play a doctor that heals people. Right. It, and it's a, and, and, but it's all kind of elitist where it's like only one thing or only the other thing and not just like, hey, why not? It's like that Doritos commercial or whatever the hell that commercial is. Why not both? Right. Ex exactly. What 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 is that commercial? <laughs> I don't know. Some Super Bowl commercial about a chip or like a uh, whatever. Who cares? That's the honest answer is who cares? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So I, I like this. I like that almost anything can be a game. I yeah. think we should embrace it. And I think most of you do. You are again. I'm blowing lots of smoke up your ass today, but not you, Chris, the audience. Well, it's Christmas. Yeah. You are sophisticated. Good cheer. Mm -hmm. and yeah, we are in good cheer. All right, Chris, let's get into the audience Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. I solicited specifically what they wanted to talk about within this realm of memory. 
this realm of remembrance of 2018 as we punt this year behind us and never look back to it ever again. Beat it <laughs> mercilessly. Remember when people wanted 2017 to end? They didn't think it could get any worse than 2017. And then 2018 came and it was even worse. And now it's going to just happen again. 2019 yeah. is just going to be even worse than 2018. Yeah. You know, it, I, no, I hate always, to throw it, it, it always, out there, but <laughs> that, that always happens. It we all know somehow it's true. gets worse. We all know it's true, right? You know it to be true. Yeah. In your heart. Bandwagon wrote into us on Patreon. And remember, you can support the show on Patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early ad free access to our show. Like many thousands of you do. We appreciate that. About 5,000 of you over there right now, which is so appreciated. Thank you so much. And that's the way you can submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas when I post every Friday a thread for you guys to populate. Bandwagon did. He said, I enjoyed seeing Battle, or I'm sorry, Battlefront 2, Battlefield 5, and Andromeda fail thanks to varying combinations of greed, subpar developers, and or shoehorning politics and ideology. Now, I was a little confused about this because two of those three games didn't come out this year, but Battlefield 5 did seem to struggle a little bit maybe because of its ideological bent. You'll notice that on the sales charts that we discussed, that Battlefield doesn't really appear in them. You know, like it's not there. And like we've said many times, Chris, there will be winners and there will be losers. But do you take pleasure out of seeing games fail? Because I don't know that I really do. Unless one of these people has done something very personal to me, which I don't think any of them have. I don't know that I'd necessarily be like, ha ha ha. Like even with Fallout 76, like I like them. I don't want them to fuck up, but they did. We should learn from it. But that celebratory nature of like watching people fail, you know, the the schadenfreude of it all, as as it were, doesn't resonate with me. Yeah, no, me neither. I'm not really a huge fan of seeing, especially because I don't, I don't really particularly think Andromeda is a bad game, but I think Battlefield is a pretty solid, it's got problems, but I don't think it's nearly, I'm kind of sad, I'm really actually kind of bummed that it's not doing well. It's on the to playlist for yeah. me, Battlefield 5. It's on my PS4, it's downloaded, I want to play the campaign, it's supposed to be very good. I will hopefully get there. Did you get a haircut? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. I got it on my birthday. That's like 18 days ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, alas. <sighs> Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah, we're all out of it. I think I'm having like a sh- slow years long stroke. <laughs> Just like a, like, re- a really like slow- four or five year long <laughs> stroke, like where it's slowly setting in. You know what I mean? A like, slow mo stroke. Like a slow, exactly like a slow mo stroke. Again, that's kind of like another innuendo, I guess. Yeah. Phil Crowen wrote into us. Said, hey, guys, 2018 was an incredible year. Sony from a games perspective or for Sony from a games perspective. It doesn't say for Phil because he didn't write that in there. Thanks. But I wouldn't be surprised if 2018 proves to be the year that Sony's investment in VR started to pay off between a ton of great games and a price point that is finally proving too good to pass up. Sony seemed to have finally turned a corner with VR. I don't know if you'll agree if it's a big deal now, but if PSVR is a pillar of Sony's offerings for years to come, it'll be because of how well 2018 was for the platform. I actually agree with you. I think that very silently, this thing is kind of, I guess, sputtering is the right word because it's not like, you know, doing gangbusters numbers, but it's like kind of like the automobile that could. It's like an old VW bug from the 60s that's kind of just going and they're like, all right, you know, (laughs) they want to kill Vita, but they're not going to kill this thing. Well, apparently it's selling pretty well for a VR unit, too, which which actually shocked the hell out of me. Yeah, it's outselling, I think, the other VR units combined. And now you're a proud owner. Have you taken yours out of the box yet? No, because I I didn't have the, the PlayStation camera. Oh, it didn't come with the camera? No, it didn't come with the camera. Oh, well, that's my fault. <laughs> so um, I, I think my roommate has one, but he's gone for the holidays, and I think he took it with him for some... Because he's a psycho like that who takes a, a PlayStation camera with him on vacation. But uh, I think I'm just going to buy it off him for like 20 bucks. Nice, it, okay. Yeah. I thought it came with it. I don't know where I... Don't even know where I got it. It would like. make sense to assume that. Yeah, it would make sense to assume But that. it did not. So I haven't messed around with it yet. But I did buy uh, a PSVR for... A uh, cousin of mine in New York. Oh, so you're doing unto others. Yeah, I'm Look doing unto others. Look you, Mainly so. because I, I want to play Beat Saber while I'm in New York. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's ulterior <laughs> motives. Yeah, there is an ulterior motive. By the way, let me ask you this. How do you pack when you go home? Are you a light packer or a heavy packer? I notice you only have like a like a you know a backpack with you and a like a roller board. Yeah, that's, that's uh, how that's, I pack too. That's unusual for me. I usually just do a backpack, but I want to bring stuff back, like the PS1, which is just not going to fit in my backpack. I usually just, like, I have clothes there. I have another editing rig there. I don't really need much aside from my laptop, underwear, socks, and my mic. So, well, there I'm you a go. light packer. I like packing light. Yeah. I don't, I don't like to deal with the carousels. No, oh, no, 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 no. See, like, I, I'm getting that bag on the plane. Yeah. 
Like, come hell or high water, I'm getting on that. I will elbow you out of the way to get on that plane. But I'm the Alaska MVP now, so I can get on, you know, before everyone else and, you know, get settled in, get that space because I'm not checking that fucking bag. <laughs> All right. I'm not doing it. I've seen how they treat check bags. It's horrendous. Oh my God. Who knows if you're going to get it on the other end? Who knows? I don't even know what the hell's going on in JFK at any given time. Yeah, no. A goddamn free for all in that, in that airport. A lot of nice amenities, though. David S. Graham wrote into us. Azan had a similar note, but we went with David's today. He says, hello, Colin and silly Christopher. <sighs> what is that? Silly. Silly. Oh, it's me. Silly Christopher. Back at it again. It makes you sound like a little bit mentally incapacitated. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, a, like, I'm a, like I'm a clown, like a disabled clown. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be negative here, so I'm going to just go with a couple of a favorite moments or the like. Not sure if it could be defined as a specific moment, but the Shadow of the Colossus remake in February was honestly probably the most impactful release of the year for me. Blue Point took something that was already a high art and turned it into the most gloriously beautiful thing it could possibly be. Kind of wish it got more praise. The other moment that deserves mentioning is the return of Colin's unique brand of enthusiasm and pessimism to a PlayStation dedicated podcast. Thank you for that, David. You are a Shadow of the Colossus fan, Chris. Yeah, I honestly, I just totally forgot that it came out in February. I yeah, thought it was I, I thought it was a December game from last year for some for some reason. That's one of my other aneurysms, I guess. <laughs> it just it, it, it took hold of me. This year has lasted way longer than 365 days. I, I guarantee it feels it. like it just feels like a lot of games came out this year. And I just like assumed, well, well, God of War, Spider-Man, Detroit, Red Dead. Couldn't possibly be room for uh, Shadow of the Colossus. There's no way that came out this year, too. This is a good year. It is a good year. It's a great year. But I think if you look at the science behind the year, it's lasted longer than 365. Oh, yeah. It's definitely a 500 day long year that uh, people have not quite caught up with yet. <sighs> Man, it just it's warned. an anomaly that I think we should probably be looking into a little bit more carefully. Does this this kind of time of year kind of depresses me? It's like Does a it? no man's land. You know, it's like. <laughs> Yeah, Christmas, whatever. And then, you know, you have like this week where you're just like like waiting for the year to end. There's like nothing really going on. Nothing's really happening. Weird shit on TV. Twilight Zone marathons on sci-fi. That oh. depresses you? A Twilight Zone marathon on sci-fi? No, actually, it's that's like one great, of the few things that's that's a, a great that doesn't show. depress me. Oh, I love that show. Yeah. I guess that's one of the few things that doesn't depress me. Also, Black Mirror is coming back. Yeah. That's exciting. Oh, so I guess it's not all that bad. Yeah, look at that. William Carroll wrote into us, Chris. He said, hey, guys. My favorite memory is picking up Doom 2016 for precisely $1 on Black Friday. Ooh, you hit the jackpot with that one, dude. With PlayStation giving me $15 in store credit and Doom's discounted price of $16, I couldn't ask for a better price. Now Doom sits as one of my favorite games I have played this year. Hashtag Chris was right. Ooh, I feel good about that one. That makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. That's a Christmas spirit right there. That is the Christmas spirit on Mars. Tyler Oldfield wrote into us. Tyson Williams, Connor Peterman, and Brandon Hardman also had similar thoughts. Said, my favorite memory of 2018 was when I beat God of War, but also the personal events around God of War. My second son was due on April 27th, and God of War came out on the 20th. I swore to myself I would not rush this game. I took my time and finally finished it on April 26th at 9.30 p.m. My son was born 10 hours later. Great memory. That's awesome. Did you name him Boy? Boy. Jimmy Champagne had a God of War memory as well. He said, my favorite gaming moment this year was taking down the Queen of the Valkyries in God of War. It was also the most challenging. What was your most challenging gaming moment this year? That was definitely it. Did you fight the Queen of the Valkyries in God of War? Absolutely not. Holy moly. <laughs> Absolutely not. I saw my roommate Impossibly doing it. Impossibly hard. My roommate was doing it. I asked him like, hey, how's, how's this? How's it going? And he, the first thing he said to me, he, was, he turned to me and was like, I'm not having fun. <laughs> but he's like so driven to finish. I was like, no, okay. that battle wasn't fun at all. <laughs> okay, I'm. I think I'm just gonna leave this end game stuff for uh, maybe future senile Chris to come back to and uh, mess around with. It's perfect for senility because it will drive you into complete insanity, as if you're a 90 or 100 year old person. Now you have to beat the Queen of the Valkyries to get the platinum. So I did beat the Queen of the Valkyries. I do like that like little arena, like worship space that they have where you yeah. put the helmets on each of the chairs and stuff as you collect them, which is really cool. But yeah, she kicked my ass and that was definitely the hardest moment of the year. There, it's very rare to encounter things like that. That reminded me of like old, the old Xbox Ninja Gaiden games. These games that are fucking really hard where I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. You know, like, <laughs> I don't know if my old fucking fragile fingers can keep up with this shit anymore as I. God, we really are just talking about like all of the deficiencies that we have. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. We're falling apart at the seams. I don't I'm know if insane. I had a hardest moment this year. I feel like getting Red Dead finished in time, honestly. I had to speed through that, kind of. Yeah, we pushed it out a week, too. We were supposed to record a week earlier. I also was... I just couldn't believe it wouldn't end. I'm like, this game won't end. I Also, I didn't want it to end. 
silly Christopher. I'm not letting that one go. That's so off-putting. I don't like that. It is. It is. Yeah, it is off-putting. It's definitely off-putting, which is why I'm not going to let it go. Thomas Connolly, I was about to read your question. We got halfway through it. I'm editing it out. It's kind of a spoiler for God of War. I'm going to skip it. Brock Smith wrote in and said, now, this is a serious one. Okay. Okay. So 2018 was hands down the worst year of my entire life. Oh, no. To make a long story short, I found out my wife had been having an affair and in doing so destroyed our marriage and created a broken home for our son, who I consider to be the best thing I've ever been a part of and unequivocally the most important purpose in my life. To add a metric crap ton of salt to my wounds, a DNA test revealed he wasn't actually mine. This boy, a little exclamation point after that, who I've spent years of my life thinking was mine, staying up late nights, rocking him to sleep, singing to him and joyfully trying to put out features in his face that I thought reflected my grandparents or cousins, was now ripped out of my heart. God of War released just a couple weeks after I moved out of my home and separated from him. So what I thought would offer a preview from emotional anguish ended up removing the scales from my eyes that fathering isn't merely DNA donation. Fathering is actionable investments into the life of a child you love, care for, and teach through life using your past as guiding stepping stones to help them be better, as Kratos says. God of War reaffirmed what I was already feeling in my heart to do, and I'm happy to say he's now legally my son. Wow. It's a pretty heavy one. That is a heavy one. I never know how to react. I always feel like I have really bad reactions to these things. I never know how to be a good person. Well, it's not only that. It's like... (laughs) It's really heavy, though, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, too. No, it is heavy, but he wrote into it. He wrote into us, and we're using it. We appreciate it. There are games that happen in certain people's lives that I think mean something to them, distract them from certain things, and they can be totally random. Like, it doesn't have to be, like, this amazing game that came out that, like, you're having a problem with your daughter, and then The Last of Us comes out and reminds you of the importance of the relationship with the daughter. You know, like, I don't think it has to be that literal. This was very literal for him. But I think that games just crop up in our lives that stick with us because they were there when we really needed them at a certain time. And, you know, I have games like that, and I'm sure you do, too. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I'm glad that at least things are evolved with or resolved, I should say, with your son. Sean Sanicandro wrote into us, Chris, and said, my favorite gaming moment was definitely playing Spider-Man with my older brother. We were really close when we were younger and obsessed over Treyarch Spider-Man games on the PS2, as well as the movies themselves. We've grown apart a bit over the years due to a lot of factors such as long distance, college work, getting married, etc. He recently moved back to my area just in time for the new game's release. Having him over and playing the game together has been a blast and a great way to reconnect with him. That's beautiful. That is very beautiful. That's I like so nice. that. See, that's a little more uplifting after the last letter although the last letter again ended in an yeah. uplifting fashion yeah we're, we're going on up on, on an uh, upward trajectory here we are relinquishing the shackles of senility relinquishing the shackles of insanity as we move forward through these questions or so we can all hope it's nice hayden wrote into us Corey han connor l and bruno moyaho wrote in with similar thoughts but we're going to go with hayden he said good day colin and chris I would just like to thank you all for your hard work this year on Sacred Symbols. One of my favorite gaming moments was seeing the logo for Sacred Symbols and finding out that you'd be collaborating with a YouTuber I first encountered on a Drunken Peasants live stream many years ago. Looking forward to many more infant sacrifices <laughs> and informed commentary. Thank you, Hayden, and everyone else. A lot of people wrote in about how this was their favorite moment was when the show was announced and when we yeah. started rolling it out, and I appreciate that. You know, we are doing our very best to make a show that's entertaining and informative. We know that you have a lot of choices. Maybe not so much in the PlayStation ecosystem, But I think our show is great. I really do. I'm so glad that people are enjoying it. And I think I found the perfect co-host in Chris. And I like how people are taking to you, Chris. This is all so so cheery and nice. It is. It is. Oh, man. You have to get on the plane soon, though. So don't be uh, too happy. Carlos Streif wrote in us and said, hey, Colin and Chris. Honestly, my favorite moment in 2018 was literally every episode of Sacred Symbols. I was so happy to see Colin doing the best PlayStation podcast in the world again and doing that with an awesome new co-host, Chris. Other than that, I think some favorite moments were Platinum and God of War and seeing gameplay footage for Cyberpunk 2077. Least favorite moment is probably not having a release date for The Last of Us Part 2 yet. That gameplay trailer looked incredible, though. Anyways, thanks for making my 2018 so amazing, guys. Here's to an amazing 2019, full of great games and Sacred Symbols episodes. Happy holidays to you all. Thank you, Carlos Strife, for that. Cyberpunk was another nice moment. Yeah. Now, we knew that they were working on it, but we really got to see it for the first time and hear about it in a robust way for the first time. And I think that game's obviously another reason why Bethesda Game Studios has a lot to fear. We talk a lot about Bethesda on here. I don't mean to insult them, but so it is. Well, they just got to kick it into high gear. It's like we said last week, now with this Outer Worlds game being sci-fi, I mean, like Starfield has a direct competitor in that space that you assume is going to be very similar to it. So we'll see how it all shakes out. Yeah. Richter86 wrote in, said, Salut. Hope Chris enjoyed the early Christmas gift he got when they announced Crash Team Racing would be remastered. 
Lots of good moments this year, like the wave of relief that I decided to wait instead of getting Fallout 76 at launch. Also, I finally got my first Platinum Trophy this year. During a lull in work early in the year, I had some time to go through the back catalog of, of games and played an evil run of infamous Second Son and got the Platinum. I was wondering what the longest period of time you ever had between starting and finishing a game, whether that is getting all achievements or trophies or just completing the main story. I had beaten it already, but I think when they released Bioshock on PS3, I think I went something like six years in between the first oh, really? trophy and the last trophy, yeah. Wow. Huh, I don't know. I think, for, like I think for me it was, I think it might actually have been Bioshock. Because I picked up Bioshock when it came out, but I was scared of it. It terrified, the elevator scene in the beginning terrified the hell out of me, and I put it down for like four years. <laughs> and, then I, and then I went back to it and finished it. But no, I did enjoy uh, that early Christmas gift. The tease for Crash Team Racing came out on my birthday too, which I, I flipped out. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's that was a nice awesome. serendipitous moment. It was. And with the year being 500 days long, it's weird that they were able to sync that all up. Yeah, it's crazy. Thomas Pinkerton wrote into us and said, hi guys. With Mega Man 11 being a big disappointment for you personally, Colin, it's not a big disappointment. It's just, it's good. It's fine. I was wondering if Chris had any personal disappointments of the same magnitude. Anything disappoint you in games this year? I don't think so. I feel like I'm weirdly optimistic about games compared to a lot of people. Like, I feel like even if I'm playing, even Fallout 76, I was pretty, you know, I mean, I, I, I was harsh on it, but even I was, I feel like I was the least down on it, as, or at least the least down on it that I've seen. I think you treated internet. it fairly. I think I treated it pretty fairly. I'll find enjoyment in anything as long as, you know, it's entertaining and it's moderately well put together. <laughs> So I don't know if I had any disappointments this year. I think this whole year has been pretty positive. I agree. I actually think 2018 is going to go down as a very good year. Yeah. For video games. You know, and there are years like that. 2007 is often looked at as a year like that. 2002 is looked at as a year like that. Like, I think that this is going to be another one of those years. I think the biggest thing maybe was like the fact that they put the piranha plant in Smash Brothers. And I was like, what? Yeah, that's stupid. What is that? Because he's not a character. He's an enemy. Yeah. Now, and he's not like one enemy. And Wart from Super Mario 2 is still not in it. You know, Dr. Wily from Mega Man, yeah. still not in it. It makes, it makes no sense to me. Whatever. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. Now well, we're getting back to, now we're getting like I negative know. again. It all curves back down. It all, it all. It's a roller coaster, this show. Is. Ryan Harvey wrote into us and said, happy holidays from San Francisco. My biggest blunder for me was seeing the handling of the PS Classic. Oh. The advertising team made an amazing commercial seen in the Game Awards, but they missed the mark. Best point was the fantastic resurrection of God of War. The previous installments made an impact on me that lessened with each iteration and it finally grew with me. Kudos. PlayStation Classic, of course, is another thing we that, have to talk about. That might be the, the thing that I forgot. The negative thing this year. I think that was the disappointment for me, actually. I totally forgot about it because I think I've been suppressing it about how disappointed I was with it. But yeah, it's definitely that now that I read that. They really did shit the bed with that thing. Yeah. And reading more and more about it, I, didn't, I was going to put it on the show last week or two weeks ago, I think when we were discussing PlayStation Classic about how, like, I just don't want to encourage people to be, you know, emulating and doing all sorts of stuff and, like, stealing stuff. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be a show like that. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I'm not your fucking dad. But how easy it is, I think, for people to just manipulate the shit out of this thing already. Not unusual. NES Classic and SNES Classic are also easy to manipulate. But the thing has, like, you know, different regions games and it doesn't run right. And it's so half-assed. It's just so dumb. And it's clearly not selling. I'm getting pictures of and seeing them all over the Internet of people. You couldn't find an NES Classic anywhere for like a year. You know, I don't know. I, I just don't know who's I don't know who's excited about this thing. I, I don't know who's like, I need to have the PlayStation Classic. Yeah, I went to I went to a GameStop actually looking for the PlayStation camera actually for the PSVR. And uh, they said they didn't have any. But I was like, do you guys have any PlayStation Classics? And they were like, oh, we got a bunch. <laughs> I was like, oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> just asking. Christian Larson wrote into us. And so the music at the end of Red Dead Redemption 2, when you know you're getting towards the culmination of the never ending saga that kicks in when you've just accomplished a mission and have to take your horsey for a ride is utterly blissful. I think that that's vague enough for me to keep in there. I choose a quest location, turn on cinematic mode and listen intently and slump in my couch and blaze. This is my best moment of the year. Oh, yeah, definitely. The D'Angelo songs in that game are amazing. Very good pull, Mr. Larson. Joseph Addy wrote into us. Sydney Linders had a similar question. We're going to go with Joseph or a similar comment, I should say. Hey, Chris and Colin, my favorite gaming moment of the year was getting the Platinum in Spider-Man, beating Detroit Become Human, and just recently beating God of War. I played every iteration of God of War, and the story was just as engaging as any Uncharted game. I actually agree with you completely. I was never interested in the story of God of War, neither was I, so it was extremely enjoyable. Merry Christmas. Thank you for your letter, Joseph. I wanted to focus on this one, Chris. With Spider-Man, he said he got the Platinum in it. I did too. That was your first Platinum. Do yeah. you anticipate getting more Platinum trophies in 2019? Maybe. I'm not really a hardcore completionist. It's really got to be something that I'm really, like, really feeling. 
And Spider-Man was just that thing for me because it's been so long since I played a good Spider-Man game or a good superhero game in general. It really sucked me in and I, I just felt like I wanted to do it. My prediction is that you will get the Platinum Trophy in Days Gone. Really? Yes. My prediction hmm. is that you're going to like that game. That's an interesting uh, prediction. Mm. Maybe. I know for a fact Crash Team Racing is definitely going to be another Platinum. I need to write this down. Crash Team Racing it will be the one that I will absolutely, I will get a Platinum Pro Trophy in that. If, if for no other reason, if for no other reason just to prove how adept I am at it. I need that. Etched in stone. I'm going to etch something else in stone. Yeah? Well, well, that's paper, Colin. Well, this is, yeah, this is paper. It's a shitty notebook. Dude. I hate this fucking notebook. But I want to write something down. <laughs> it's just so negative. <laughs> <laughs> he picks up a notebook and he's like, I hate this notebook. But I want to write something down because... You know, back in the day when I was at IGN, I, you know, everyone does E3 predictions and like, you know, all this, these predictions things. And I'm telling you right now, we really did start that trend and now everyone does it back in the day. And so that's why I don't like doing conventional things like that anymore. And so what I want to do instead, and I'm going to write this down so we don't forget, I want to do predictions. I'm writing this down very carefully. Predictions on what the other person is going to think about games. Oh, yeah. The other person will think. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That's fun. So what we're going to do next year, I'll make a segment on this, a slow week, and we'll just predict what the other person's actually going to think when the game comes out. But that will require complete candor and honesty when the game comes out. We can't play, you know, a game and then pretend we don't like it in order to satisfy the yeah. prediction. We'll write it, We'll write our own things down separately and keep it to ourselves. Yes. And then we'll uh, exchange them. Yes. That's a great idea. Yeah. Look at that. We're back on the upswing again. Yeah. Look at that. Pedro Escobar wrote into us and said, favorite moni- moment? Favorite Moni. Moni. I have another. It's another Tevin <laughs> moment. <laughs> the Moni Malay station. Sony first party reaching mainstream elite status or the Nintendo status, as I call it. God of War, Spider-Man, Detroit are all verified hits. Add in Horizon from 2017 and looking to the future with The Last of Us 2 and Death Stranding. I think the brand is stronger than ever. Least favorite, Sony shitting the bed with PlayStation Classic. Yeah. Well, we've already gone there, but I agree with you. We're really getting somewhere. Ghost of Tsushima you left out. Days Gone you left out. I actually think we're moving here. That, yeah, Sony studios have shrunk and truncated. They're more silent than ever, but they're releasing more high quality games than ever. I think pound for pound, they're the best first party. I'm not just saying that because I love PlayStation. I think that I think they're clobbering the other guys in terms of volume of quality right now. Yeah, no, I, I would uh, absolutely agree. I think they're, def- they're definitely clobbering, clobbering Microsoft. For sure. For, for sure. Nintendo is, is debatable. I would argue, yeah, they are still winning in that in that regard because as, as good as uh, Zelda and Mario and Smash is, I mean, God of War is like something else. Yeah, God of War and Spider-Man, and we're and we're reading into the future. We don't know how the games of 2019 are going to be at this juncture, but you have to assume they've got something going here. They have some momentum. I mean, you don't really have a bad or a truly mediocre first-party game since Knack. Yeah, you really and that don't. Was at the, and that was at the very beginning. Yeah, it's a launch game. So that's a long time to go without... Like, I think about games like mediocre Xbox One games or mediocre received Xbox One games like ReCore. There's like nothing like that on PlayStation, I don't think, from like a first party or an incubated game. So, yeah. Oh, actually, that's not true. The Order. Mm, That was a while ago also, though. That's true. Uh, What was that? Like 2015? I think it was February 2015. Yeah. So that was like even that was like a ways away. So they've been doing really good for quite some time. Yeah, I agree. Everything's been uphill since then. Robert wrote into us and said, hey, guys, first time writer and new patron. Thank you for your support, Robert. We appreciate you. Yeah. Fan of the PlayStation content and recently binged about 10 episodes of Knockback. That's my nostalgia and retro podcast that I do with my brother. People are really enjoying that as well. And we, we thank you for that, too. One of my favorite moments this year is having Symphony of the Night coming to PS4. I missed it on PlayStation 1 and tried playing it on Vita, but something was very wrong with the inventory system and I couldn't change weapons. Sounds like a you problem, frankly, Robert. So finally getting it on PS4 was a welcome surprise. I don't really care that the bundle was kind of bare bones. It's got the special features on a Blu-ray as I wouldn't have paid attention to any of that stuff anyways. Yeah, I didn't mind that there were no features per se. It would have been nice with how Capcom is treating their games. It was that menu that really got me. It was just the menu. It's hideous. It looks like an intern made it It like accidentally. It looks like a two year old made it. It looks like someone accidentally made it. I mean, that's I can go on and on. But I agree with you. Once you get into the games, they run fine. Rondo of Blood runs really great, too. And that was a great moment. I was stoked when they announced Symphony that it was coming to PS4 yeah. so I can get my trophies in it. And that collection's nice. And hopefully testing the waters for more Castlevania games to come. So I'm with you there 100%, Robert. Thank you again for being a new patron and supporting us over at patreon.com slash Stand. 
Mark Elfering wrote into us, Chris, and said, I would just like to congratulate Chris on single-handedly willing Crash Team Racing remastered into existence, as well as the widespread use of grappling hooks. <laughs> but for me, I've quite enjoyed my first year with a PS4, with God of War being a cinematic spectacle that I lost many a night's sleep playing. Still need to play Horizon, though, so that's next after Red Dead Redemption 2. You are in for a treat, my friend. I think Horizon's better than God of War. The biggest letdown of the year is the amount of children I have to have to see doing Fortnite dances at the minor league hockey games I regularly attend makes my blood boil. If a multiplayer game is going to come out, the people who are playing Fortnite, I would like to stay where they're where they're at. You know, <laughs> just stay in Fortnite. You know, I'll, I'll enjoy my ecosystem here, yeah, and they can and they there. can do their uh, dances that they're getting sued over. Who's Backpack Boy? Or backpack man. He's a meme kid who did a dance, and now that dance is in Fortnite, and now he's suing Epic. For so he's dance. not like an entertainer. That's like really what he's known for. He did that dance once at one time. I think so. I'm not well versed on the lore of backpack kid. Oh, backpack kid. So I got it wrong. Boy or man was not okay. No, backpack kid. <laughs> no, yeah. And I, does he always wear a backpack? Is no, I just think he was wearing a backpack when he did the dance. Then they just that was the best they could come up with. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, well, everyone's suing Epic over Fortnite dances. You can, by the way, trademark dances, so they you, do have some sort of case. You definitely can. I don't know if there's legal precedent for it, though. Like, I've never seen this happen before that I can recall. Like, a, a lawsuit over a dance? Yeah, I don't know. Michael Jackson would have had a field day. My God. I don't know, man. Because there's no way they just paid Michael Jackson to moonwalk for them to, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Different times, though. Litigious times. It seemed like it started kind of a cascade. Like, someone came up... I think it was the guy from Fresh Prince might have even been the first one. Or yeah, Alfonso or so, Ribeiro. Yeah. Carlton from Carlton, Fresh Prince. Who fucking rules, of course. But yeah, there's something where, you know, someone figured out, oh, yeah. And then I was like, oh. But who's intellectual property? Like, did he invent that dance or was that dance thought up by a writer for Carlton to do? And if so, who owns that intellectual property? Apparently he came up with it. But apparently in an interview, he also admitted, I think it was in the 90s, that he kind of like took pieces of different dances and put them together. Uh, of course. So now he, that's the whole thing that he has to deal with. Yeah. I'm sure they're just looking for Epic to be like, just take $250,000 and just to get the fuck away from me. You know, I think that's probably going to be the solution. Like, we'll just settle this and be done with it. Where the, the game's printing money anyway. But I like your thought, Chris, that Fortnite keeps them all. Everyone's there, you know, so stay, stay there. Yeah, those people. Those particular. people. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by those people? Oh, no. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I've been fired. <laughs> <laughs> by the way uh mark noted that he's new to the playstation ecosystem where he said he said my first year with a ps4 so welcome you're a little late but welcome and it's good to know that people are still buying this console and still jumping in with us hey i was exciting. a little late i got it in 2016 it's because you're a loser oh, that was a little harsh i guess that was huh? a little harsh jeez that was a little mean that's not very christmassy i know Colin? that was a little mean my gosh this is a very schizophrenic episode i'll give you that much <laughs> schizophrenia on full display Final question, comment, concern, thought, and idea. Chris comes from Neo JD, who says Sony's attitude towards cross-platform play. I don't even care about cross-platform play personally, but their whole attitude towards it as if and the BS answers they gave in interviews about it rubbed everyone the wrong way. That's a great point. Yeah, that's another good poll. Definitely not worse than the uh, classic, but no, but it was up there. I think that it might have actually been maybe the worst thing Sony did this year until the classic. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. outdid themselves indeed. And now this Vita thing with this Vita, you know, yeah. I know this is not going to make a lot of news because no one cares about the Vita anymore, but the reality is people do care about the Vita. People do care about it. And that's the most embarrassing moment now for me is that they can't even meet demand for their last Vita fucking cart order. What kind of nonsense excuse are we going to hear about this? <laughs> that they, they ran out of the precious plastic material that they need. They don't want to manufacture more of it. There's going to be some sort of nonsense. Yeah. That they can't just ramp up like... They can't just whatever fucking Foxconn factory was spitting those things out. They can't. <laughs> Has this ever happened before? It did. So, well, cartridges used to be allotted on SNES and Genesis. And when I did the history of Naughty Dog, which was a big piece that I did that people might be familiar with. You can Google it. It's like 50,000 words. So have fun. Good Lord. Jumping into that. But they were talking about how when they made their Genesis game Rings of Power that they sold through their 200,000 unit allotment almost immediately or very quickly, and they couldn't get more because EA was their publisher and EA's Genesis allotment was all used up for the rest of the year on Madden cartridges. So they never published the game again. So they sold 200,000 copies of it or whatever, and that was the end. Wow. So yeah, it has happened in the past. That's interesting. But that's a real excuse because the chipsets were expensive to manufacture. That's why everyone moved to CD to begin with. So these little SD cards, this is why you don't make proprietary shit, first of all. Yeah. And second of all, it just it just rubs me the wrong way. It rubs me the wrong way how this affects adversely affects the Vita community. It affects limited run games. It affects people excited about this. The developers that announced their games for Vita. 
pisses me the fuck off a little bit. Yeah, no, that absolutely sucks. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Chris, that's all I have. It's, it's, a, it's a strange week. It is a strange week. It's a truncated week because we we're recording earlier, but also, you know, it's the holiday season. I just wanted to make sure people had their news and another episode to go. Again, we're not going to miss any episodes. Every every week we're going to have a Sacred Symbols episode unless something horrifying happens to one of us or both of us. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, well. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so Merry Christmas to all of you out there. Happy Hanukkah as we wish you all, you know, happy Kwanzaa, whatever. All these things I think have passed by the time you're hearing this, but we appreciate you. Hope you have a good new year, Chris. We'll see you in two episodes. This is going to be the first time I do an episode by myself, but we'll have you back for our game of the year episode. I am very excited to give our game of the year awards out. And uh, do you have any last comments for the audience before you go? No, I just uh, I hope <laughs> I hope I can get work done on this flight. Just like, accept that you're not going to work on the flight. Yeah, probably not. I've but never... I am working on stuff. It is coming out soon. I know I know it's a bit of a meme now that I don't upload, but uh, there's stuff coming. and I'm, I'm excited about it. Well, I'm excited to see it. And uh, well, I wish you very well. I wish you and your family very well. Happy holidays to the uh, Maldonado clan. Mm-hmm. Appreciate and you, you guys. And uh, yeah, happy holidays to all of you out there. Thank you so much for supporting our show, Sacred Symbols. Remember, you can do so on Patreon, patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. Early ad free access to every episode, the ability to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas that we read on the air, exclusive podcasts, and much more. If you listen on free feeds, please do consider leaving us a nice review and a nice score on the podcast service of your choice. It helps us algorithmically find new audiences chris let's get the fuck out of here all right take care guys happy holidays sacred symbols a playstation podcast is fan supported over at patreon.com slash collins last stand the following names are at the producer level or higher on patreon and i want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity morgan ashley sean battershaw martin beck fred bentz michael betts eric bishop david blodel mark bogio spencer brand lennon brixey matthew brousseau josh bushing austin bullock dylan burns alex cabrera brian cacciatolo will caldwell Luis cancato william o'carroll matthew carter brian chan travis chandler sean chandler kenneth char david chestnut simon conception jr brad cooley cutter crow nick cummings daniel diamore daniel del nicos travis depew mitchell durkash david ellis albert escobar brian fink joe finelli eric finkenbeiner stefano fontana Fodios Frangos, Connor Gagian, Alexander Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem Al Ghanem, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Ryan Greenwood, Miranda Grubba, Andres Guzman, Tyler Harris, Kyle Hagel, Wyatt Henry, Asa Haas, Azan Isa Al Raisi, Josh Yeager, Justin Yeager, Paul Joyce, Greg Julius, Jeremy Key, James Kinslow the Third, Ryan R. Kitredge, Christian Larson, Jackson Lastiqua, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Ashlyn Lee, Anthony Lencioni, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Mark Liberto, Aaron Litwiller, Lou and Ray. Loper, Colin Love, Josh M, Ryan T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Joe McPartland, Wyatt McVeigh, Dennis Meinchin, Andrew Mendoza, Christopher Middling, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Brian Nietzsche, Josh Netzel, Adam Nix, George Anthony Nunez, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, James Perone, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Matthew Plaster, Lawrence F. Prokop, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Jonathan Rice, Toby D. Riemenschneider, Austin Riley, Atenogenis Rojas, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, John Scholes, Christopher Schaefer, Michael Shanholtz, Toby Schutman, Joshua Smallwood, John Tamanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Tam Tran, Adam Van Curen, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Mike Wayant, Tyler Woodall, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zuniga, Supershot ST, Ethan, Throw7, Infinite, Barrick, Mubarak, Richter86, Dav9834, Titus Rex, Donk2015, Gavin, and Random Guy Radio. Crash Team Racing. Ooh, ooh, ooh.